Good evening and welcome to the 2018 Selectman's Debate. My name is Bob Casaza. I'll be moderating tonight's debate. There are five candidates seeking election to two positions on the Board of Selectmen. The Hampton Union Seacoast Online has organized this evening's debate. Patrick Cronin and Max Sullivan from the Hampton Union Seacoast Online will be asking the candidates questions which the newspaper has formulated. Candidates participating this evening, we have four out of the five. Unfortunately, Mr. McNamara uh, is unable to join us um, tonight because he has the flu. So we will press on with uh, Brian Provencial, James Waddell, Mary Louise Woolsey, and Timothy Citizen Jones. The ground rules for tonight's debate are as follows. Patrick Cronin or Max Sullivan will read a question which will be directed to a specific candidate whose response will be limited to approximately one minute. All of the other candidates will be able to answer that question if they want to, but each candidate will get at least one question directed to him or her. Mindful that all of these questions, uh, after all these questions, the candidate uh, may still not have been able to address a, an item of interest. Uh, we will conclude uh, tonight's um, round table with uh, closing statements and each candidate will have approximately two minutes to provide uh, that closing statement and we're going to follow the order of the ballot so the ballot that you'll see on march 13th uh, goes brendan mcnamara brian provincial james waddell mary louise woolsey timothy citizen jones and we'll follow that order uh, when we do our closing statements we also have what we call as a speed round and uh, Patrick or uh, Max will be asking the candidates uh, to just give a quick impression so that we get through as many issues as we can so that the voters will have an opportunity uh, to learn as much about the candidate as we can squeeze into this one hour program. So with all of that, um, let's have the first question. Okay, uh, the first question goes to uh, Timothy Jones. Uh, what is your stance on the town's lawsuit against the state of New Hampshire? My stance is I'm 100% for it. I, I have, uh, was motivated uh, six years ago to get involved publicly over that very issue. The very issue being the state's insistence on the town taxpayers paying for maintenance of the sidewalks. It is the most absurd concept ever devised by man that the local taxpayers should be paying to maintain sidewalks or other property owned by the state of New Hampshire. The property owners themselves are the ones that are solely responsible for paying for the maintenance of their property, regardless of who that property owner is. Town of Hampton does not own those sidewalks, it does not own that road, and ought not to ever have to pay to maintain it. I read the lawsuit in detail, and while there might be a few minor nuances that I might not agree with, overall, it's an excellent filing. I support it 100%. I think this town ought to be pursuing a fair deal because we haven't been getting one. And that's all we're asking for is a fair deal. And I will maintain that stance if elected that we get a fair deal. And we pay for what, we, what we're supposed to pay for, which is the maintenance of our own property, not the maintenance of somebody else's. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Jim Waddell, you are on the Board of Selectmen at present. Um, Right, and I voted against the lawsuit, so obviously you know where I stand. You can go back and look at that. My <coughs> position there is not necessarily against suing the state. My position is that it was done emotionally and under anger, and that we should have taken and we should have gone through the deed first, narrowed it down to very specifics that we could win, that was a winnable case. We then should have had a discussion on it and decided what we were going to do and how we were going to do it, we then should have, rather than set an arbitrary date that it should be filed, we should have gone back, we should have looked at the deed again, we should have narrowed down our points, we should have been very specific so that we went in, we were sure we were going to get a return on our investment, that we had a case that was rock solid with facts, and that we would be there and that we could win it. Also, I think we, the danger is that if we open up this whole question of the deed, the danger is that we could end up paying more than we get. So I think, I, I think it should have been researched more in more detail. It should have been defined better, and it should have been gone through there. So it's not that I'm against suing the state or not that I'm against the state paying their fair share, but I think we needed to do it in a different manner. 
Thank you, Jim. Brian, uh, a business owner at the beach, your position on the, uh, the litigation the town has instituted with the state. I feel that there's been, I've, I've heard mixed reviews. I've heard both for and against it. Uh, there's a, a lot of people down the beach that work well with the state, and they feel that this could put a damper on that. Um, and that's not something I would be looking to do. I, I want Hampton to get a fair shake on it. The selectmen have spent six years on this, and they've gotten down to it, and they've decided that they wanted to bring a lawsuit to them, and I feel like they're acting in the best interest of the town. I'm for mediation. I don't think a long, drawn-out lawsuit is going to do anybody any good. Even if you win, I feel you could lose. There'll be a sour taste in the mouth. Like Jim said, there's other stuff that I... Personally, I'm not, I've been into this lawsuit for about a month. I, don't, I can't possibly understand everything they've done for six years. There's other stuff I don't understand. So to say if I'm for it or against it, I'm for the town, and I need to know more about it before you can actually get into everything else. You've been on the budget committee, and you understand more of the budget stuff than I would ever understand. I haven't got into any of that at all. I've read the lawsuit, and I've read the deed, but there's more to it. Um, I'm not for jeopardizing our relationship with the state, but I'm for getting what the town des deserves, whether or not it is anything more or it is anything less. So I'm for mediation, and right, that's my you. stance. Mary Louise, as a former member of the Board of Selectmen, you've wrestled with issues with the state. What is your position on the, on the litigation that's recently been instituted? I support what the Selectmen have done. Um, I think the pleading was excellent. I've read the entire pleading. I think it was very well crafted. As a resident and taxpayer, I feel that it is the obligation of our public officials to protect the taxpayers and residents in this community. We are being dumped on by the state of New Hampshire, and it's about time we get out from under that. If you have two parties who have a problem and they can't come to terms with each other, the time comes when you need an independent, uh, an independent person to decide and help you decide what should be done. Uh, I think it would actually be dereliction of duty for the selectmen to hold off any longer. The selectmen are supposed to look for the welfare of the taxpayers and residents in this community and we certainly have um, valid complaints about the way the state of New Hampshire is uh, spending its money and ours. All right, let's get to the next question. Do you have that one, Max? Yes, the All next right. question is for Brian Provencial. Is the town doing enough in addressing the potential contamination from the Coakley landfill and PFCs found in Aquarian Wells, which provide drinking water to Hampton residents? That's a major concern of mine. Um, I feel that Regina Barnes and Phil Bean have been doing their due diligence with that as far as they can. And what I've spoke with Regina, she's been fact-checking with outside sources, and she says that uh, Aquarian seems to be right on par with what they should be doing. I, I feel that perhaps maybe we should focus more on that. Than, that should be our main priority, I would think. Our town's drinking water, our basic infrastructure is, takes precedence over a lawsuit or noise at the beach or anything else. I think that's what we should be focusing on first, our future, our water, our children, and whatnot, so. Thank you. Tim, would you like to comment on, um, on the Coakley question? Well, I think the, uh, it's a complicated one. Uh, obviously, there have been increased measurements of PFCs in our wells. I think believe at least one of them has been closed. Uh, we have a potential enhanced water shortage problem, especially in the summertime. Uh, I understand that the probable best alternative solution in the, in the short term is to provide, is to open that closed well, but to dilute it with pure water so as to get the uh, volume of PFEs down per gallon. Uh, and that's most likely the scenario that's going to play out in 2018. However, I think we need a, a grander plan in terms of dealing with the long-term problem, and that involves uh, a variety of things, one of which is dealing with where is this leaching of PFCs coming from? Is it really coming from Coke, uh, Coakley landfill? And of course, the, the quite obvious uh, conflicts of interest and, and uh, darkness that is taking place with the group that's supposed to be uh, remediating the Coakley landfill contaminants. Uh, we also have the problem of just generally 
how clean water in terms of our wells. Do we have enough volume and so forth? Um, and we need to take a look at um, in enhancing our resources of water in terms of um, the sources themselves, how we can en enhance the volume of and the quality of that water. I think that uh, to say that you know, we need to deal with this more than something else, I, I believe that this town is a special town and is quite capable of walking and chewing gum at the same time. We can do more than one thing at a time. Thank you. All right. Jim, would you like to uh, be heard on sure. that? Sure. Uh, I would give kudos to uh, Regina Barnes for the work she's done on the water issue. She's been a, a bulldog on that, staying on it all the time. She's worked with Aquarian. I've gone to a lot of those meetings with Aquarian. Aquarian also is cooperating as much as possible. I agree with what Brian said. Uh, they've been there, they've been testing, they've been working with us, they haven't put up any roadblocks or anything to it. I think it's an extremely important issue, I think it's an issue that we can work on, I think it is an issue, and I think we can stress more some issues over others, so I think it's not walking and chewing gum at the same time, it's picking out what you want to stress and what you want to work on strongly, and I think the selectmen can do that, I think we've done a great job with it, and I think we need to know where the contaminants are coming from, and I think that that work is being done, and Aquarian is being very, very cooperative in helping with that. The Coakley landfill is a whole other issue which needs to be dealt with. Mary Louise, before we leave the question of potential contamination from the Coakley landfill, would you like to comment on, on Yes. Um, Selectman Bean and Barnes have done a great job. We also need to understand that this is a state problem, once again. And Representatives Cushing and uh, Edgar and Mindy Mesmer from Rye have done a great job, but there are problems when you are dealing with this in Concord. And so I think it needs to be a statewide concern. I don't believe Hampton is the only community facing this problem. This has got to be widespread. I read about a town in Minnesota who was finally uh, suing 3M for contaminating their water and all the, uh, the whole town is, is up in arms, but the pollution went on and on for years. It's, it's almost a countrywide problem, actually. And I think uh, so far, locally, we've done a great job with our representatives and the selectmen, but we've got to pursue it. All right, Patrick. Uh, this is question is for uh, Jim Waddell. Um, what action should the next board take to address concerns of flooding and drainage issues in Hampton? Wow. <laughs> that's, that's a huge question. And, and, you know, it's one that we have a Warren article right now to do a study on the flooding and a study on, on the, uh, uh, the issue. You know, we need to be proactive. We can't be reactive. We need to, we need to know what, how we're going to deal with it, what the potential is. I mean, there, there's no doubt that the sea rise is rising that the level of the floods is becoming more and more. And we need to come up with issues that are going to, you're not going to stop the water, but how can we mitigate the damage that's being done? You know, what can we do with new buildings, raising them up on stilts maybe, moving the electrical to the second or third floor? So there are, there are a variety of issues, but the, the most important thing is to stay proactive, to stay on top of it, to make sure that our infrastructure is in good shape, that all our drainage, that the state drainage is open, that it's able to flow. So I think being proactive is the most important aspect of that. Brian, you are a member of the zoning board. You've, you've had <laughs> lots of uh, probably beach proposals, construction proposals come before you. Do you have any comment on, on what um, the Board of Selectmen could do to address the, the, the flooding issues? I, I think uh, Jim hit it right on the head there. They're, we're talking about the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it goes all the way to Europe. And when it comes up, there's on the back, if we're talking about the back strip, there's everything is below sea level there when the tide comes up. You, there's nothing you can do. My business is down there. It's always flooded. It seems, it appears to be getting a little bit worse than it has been in the past, but you can't drain the ocean. There's nowhere you could drain that to. So I agree with what Jim said there with perhaps how you build stuff down there and what you want to do. My business is down there and we had six inches of water for three days in there, and there's, you know, the tide goes out, the water goes out, tide comes back in, the water comes back in, and you just kind of, you have to go along with it and deal with it. Um, as far as how you build houses in the future in those areas, that's something you could address. Um, I, I know 
134, so it's two doors down. They just did a, a project down there where it was a condo complex. And the way that they were able to work and do that with drainage inside it and building it up a little bit, none of that property floods whatsoever. So maybe more steps like that in the future when we build in that area would be something that we could do. Okay. Tim? Well, I think that to say we need to continue to be proactive suggests we already are proactive, and I don't see that productivity. Uh, you, uh, Selectman Waddell's been on the planning uh, board as the Selectman's representative now for well over a year. I didn't see any proactivity relative to flooding at all there. And to suggest that we can do nothing at all is, to me, uh, you know, uh, not acceptable. I mean, public health, flooding is a public health issue. Good drinking water is a public health issue. Public health issues are number one issue for government, period. No question about that. Yeah, we have a harbor that is full of sand. It needs to be dredged. We need more places for the water to go to that we find it acceptable for it to be in. One of them is the harbor. That harbor absolutely needs to be dredged. We need to find more places where, where we want the water to go so that the water is not going to be inclined to go where we don't want it to be. And that's the solution to the flooding. You can't say to the water, or oh, we don't want you here. We have to encourage it to go somewhere else, somewhere else that's acceptable. Thank you. Mary Louise? Yes, the flooding is a problem. It will continue to be a problem. Probably 50 years from now, part of the beach will not be habitable. Um, you could consider a houseboat for your business. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, river, the river is flooding, too. Obviously, it's all coming in from the ocean. Uh, I don't go along with people building their ho um, homes higher because what are they going to do, look out and see both of their cars floating? in the yard. I think the planning board has a large responsibility for this and they have allowed building in a lot of wet areas and that is going to cause huge, huge problems for this community in the future. Bob, may I have one second? Sure. Sure. I think the planning board would be surprised to hear that they've not been proactive at all. I think they've talked about elevation for, for buildings and stuff. I think they have been proactive. I think they've been on it. And I think you have to realize with the ocean, with the marsh, with everything else, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So just diverting the water sometimes is going to divert it to another place. So you have to be extremely careful about how you do that. Mm. So I think, you know, I think Brian had the right answer. It's the Atlantic Ocean. It's going to be hard to stop it. You have to, if you're going to do any diverting of it, you have to make sure you know what you're doing. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Well, All right. Uh, let me just jump to another thing. I understand we so could talk about it. directed at me. Uh, well, I think it was a follow-up. It was a follow-up. Follow That's what I'd like to do. Okay. I'm going to let you do that. But first, I want to go right around the table. We have, on March 13th, maybe 49 Warren articles, 48 mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. don't include the offices. Give me, if you could, the three things that you hope. I'm going to go around the table. The three things that you hope to see out of those 48 articles, whether it be the three that pass or you say the three that don't pass. But what, as you looked at that warrant, you say, well, I hope when I wake up on March 14th, X, Y, and Z has happened. I think the articles that are focused on protecting the taxpayers, we have a, we have a huge burden right now. We need to pass the article, and I don't remember all the numbers, but we need to pass the article for the treatment plant. Okay. Absolutely. Two other things. Give and me two other things. We, <laughs> and th I don't want to see Article 9 passed. That's raiding the road capital reserve fund. And I can't think of another article that gets me excited. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jones. I, I concur that uh, Article 7, uh, which was better perfected by uh, citizen oversight, which caused it to be reduced by... $2.1 million is uh, much desired to pass. That's the wastewater treatment one. And Article 9, which has not had uh, adequate oversight and appears to have a considerable amount of deficiency regarding sensitivity to taxpayers and properly and effectively spending taxpayer money, I think that absolutely has to fail. Um, in terms of uh, passion on any of the other articles, I don't have anything coming to mind. Okay. Right. I don't want to pick any specific articles. Yeah. I would like to, the ones that deal with our basic town infrastructure, our town employees, the people that work for us, 
people that we should be taking care of because they take care of us that some of them haven't been taken care of in years. Um, those are some of my, my major concerns. Jim, yeah. you wastewater treat treatment plant, yeah. absolutely. Uh, drainage on Lafayette Road, absolutely. That's Article 9, so I'll go with that one. And the, uh, I'm going to lump them together, the contracts for our employees. Okay, good enough. Back to Max. Next question is for Tim Jones. Uh, some residents are concerned taxes have increased significantly since 2014. Have those increases been justified? And do you believe the town should reduce spending or make an effort to reduce spending in the near future? Max, I'm so glad you're giving me the easy questions. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yes, I feel it personally. The taxes have been uh, going uh, too high, too fast. And unfortunately, I have to tell you that regardless of how we vote uh, next week, if we voted everything down, tax increases are already in the pipeline and coming to a bill near you. <laughs> yeah, I think that you'll notice that when, when we have Warren articles with, with you know, large amounts of money in them, that it's then reported when the project ever gets done, that it was done under the budget. And then, of course, selectmen pat themselves on the back take the balance of that money and put it into the undesignated fund balance where it legally belongs when you have these balances, and then subsequently use the undesignated fund balances for whatever um, pet project they may think is, is uh, good to do, which of course is always unrelated to the original Warren article under which that money was raised. I think we can do a far better job in estimating these Warren article projects as well as doing a far better job in estimating certain costs in the budget. I think more uh, transparency in terms of the operation of how the money flows. And I've followed this money. You know, it's one of the reasons I got involved in the Budget Committee six years ago when the <coughs> silliness of this state insisting us in maintaining these sidewalks was brought up. That's what got me the first time in my life to speak in public. wasn't very good at it. I've been working on it. But I decided then to follow the old adage, which was follow the money. So I got on the Budget Committee, I've been following that money, and I can assure you, if the public saw what I have seen in my analysis, and I spent a considerable time analyzing this stuff, they would be uh, kind of shocked at the casual, uh, the, the casual nature in which these numbers are thrown about without any real uh, reflection on how we can be more efficient with the spending of that money. So yeah, there's things that could be done if there were leadership to see to it that it got done. Uh, Mary Louise, do you want the question repeated, or are you, you on this question? No, I, I, I think the public has a right to expect that individuals who are elected are prepared to work. Last year, the chairman announced that the summer schedule would start the next Monday night, and the next Monday night was the first Monday in May. When I worked on the boards of selectmen in my first th three or so terms, we worked every Monday, unless it was New Year's or Christmas. We need boards that are willing to do the work and sit down and go into the details. Public Works is a critical department in Hampton. We can't function for a week without the Public Works Department. And that department is being crippled by a number of situations now. I want to see boards sitting down, working through the year, and s throwing out in the public, by means of Channel 22, in-depth meetings for the serious problems that are facing us in all the departments, but particularly public works. All right, Max, I'm going to get you over on this side of the table, and if you could repeat that question for these fellows over here. Sure. Some residents have said that taxes have increased significantly in the last three years, and do you believe those increases have been justified, and should future boards watch their spending with those in mind? Uh, Brian? Um. <laughs> you can use that if you want. It seems uh, about the same, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody likes taxes. 
So I'm not going to say we should have more taxes, but every year we have votes and we have private petitions and we have the budget and things pass. And if the people are voting in these things, then your taxes are going to go up. If things are voted down, then they're going to go down. Or stay the same. I don't think they're actually ever going to go down. I don't think so. Don't quote me on that. But Jim? Municipal tax rate, 2010, 641, 2011, 713, 2012, 714, 2013, 705, 2014, 725, 2015, 791, 2016, 641, and 2017, 632. The municipal tax rate has stayed basically about the same. It's gone down a little bit. Valuations have gone up. That's good for you in one aspect, and it's bad for you in another aspect. You pay more in your taxes. If you want to sell your house, you get more for your house when you sell it. So it's hard. Transparency, that the finance director comes in here every month, sits down, and gives us a report on exactly where the money has been spent. Uh, department heads, I trust our department heads. I'm not going to micromanage our department heads. We have a, a phenomenal police chief, fire chief, DPW director, and assistant director. I'm not a junior engineer. I'm not an amateur engineer. I'm not going to go down to the DPW and tell them how to do their work. I'm going to have them come in and discuss it with us, and I do believe that the selectmen have paid attention to their budgets, paid attention to how the money's spent, and I trust those people. I will not micromanage them. Uh, I think Patrick has the next question. Uh, yes, uh, this goes to Mary Louise. Um, do you support removing the cost of sewer from the town's tax rate and billing residents for that service? No, not necessarily. We're a community. I don't have any problem with sharing uh, that expense. I don't see. But, but when we get industry in, we should be taxing appropriately. We have not been looking out for the resources that we need to um, to help give us the revenue coming in to the tax base. I was furious when I saw the industrial surcharge fee referenced in the Wright Pierce book. Uh, we let that brewery go for four years and operate without the industrial user fee, the industrial surcharge. And nobody, nobody knew or nobody told the public that they hadn't got the treatment section in place in that brewery. Do we, we, we've got a lot of stuff that needs to be done, but no, I don't, I don't see that would do any, do any good for people. Um, I think that we should keep going, but try to manage and try to find proper, appropriate sources of revenue. Let's go right around the table, Tim. This is, a, this is kind of a complicated question. Mm. To, uh, to set up this uh, sewer enterprise fund uh, would, in fact, at least in conceptual theory, uh, properly spread out the costs based on actual usage. That usage being defined by how much water you're taking in, not how much is going out. But it would be a reasonable approximation, more than what we have right now. At the same time, however, there is just a whole slew of other problems, number one of which is uh, this is no longer going to be a tax deduction on your federal income tax. <laughs> and for that reason and others which I will, do not have time to go into, it introduces a series of problems and I cannot support it. However, there is, there is some nuanced changes that could be made toward making it more based on use, usage fee and still preserving the federal income tax. For example, if we were to establish a, a baseline of, say, what's the average uh, water usage for uh, a four-bedroom home, and say, okay, that four-bedroom baseline is in the tax rate. Anything above that that you use, you're getting a separate bill on it. This way would be actually going after the extremely high water uses, such as laundry mats and car washes yeah. that are contributing the real... Uh, uh, dominant uh, increases in costs to the wastewater treatment plant. So I think there is a middle road that could be carved here. I don't support the Warren article because I don't think we need to study what is really a relatively simple financing mechanism. What we need to do is have leadership that says this is the kind of thing we want to go to. We want to try to start going down this road, but we don't want to go all the way down the road. We can do it in steps. The four-bedroom standard is the right standard to start with. Let's start with that. But we don't need to go 100% on it and take away everyone's federal tax deduction. That is just too harmful. 
to our, uh, our citizens and our taxpayers. And I don't support it as has as, as been proposed. Thank you. Uh, Brian, do you support removing the cost of sewer from the town's tax rate and billing residents for the service? That's the question. Um, no, I do not. Um, there's a lot of talk about new businesses coming in and in the industrial zone and charging them for sewer. On the zoning board, we just had a large tract of land came in here, and you'd be surprised to know that our industrial zone doesn't have sewer. They can't hook up to the sewer. <coughs> um, the brewery that you spoke of was Smutty Nose, and they went out of business, and there's a lot of talks I've heard about the next person coming in doing the stuff that they did, but they were abating their water. They were actually trucking that out. Am I correct? So <coughs> there wasn't an extra burden on the town with that. Where It, it seemed like it, when I, but then I looked into it more. So the water that they had, they were actually taking out of here to another place that wanted the water, and they were using it. So we were actually u processing less water because they were taking it out of here. Um, I don't think that it attracts industry to this town. The industry in this town, I think we could use some help, and we're not attractive as we could be. Some other towns are more attractive. Um, cost per square foot, building, stuff like that, stuff that towns do. Um, I think we should be more for getting business here rather than try to get a cash grab and get sewer and, and all kinds of other things out of them. Yeah. You know, I think it's a complicated question, and I, I, I don't think I have the answer right now to it. And I think, I think there are a lot of issues. I think Tim brought up some issues. And Brian brought up some issues. I mean, there is the federal tax deduction, you know, but should things be done just because of a tax deduction? I, I am for the study. I am for the study in coming up with a well-developed plan to implement that will make it fairer for all people concerned, both residential and industrial. I think Smutty knows that was a, a shame. They, were, they, they tried very hard. They were good, good uh, loyal citizens, and, and they, it fell apart. What they had for their treatment, they didn't get, but they were trucking that out. So it wasn't overloading our system. All right. Can I respond? Mr. Well, yeah. Two quick responses, and let's get on to this the next This is a question. perfect example. Call to spend more money for yet another study when it's just a financing mechanism. There's not a lot of complications here. Either you do or you do want not want to have it separately built. This is an example of wasteful spending of taxpayer money. That was referring to earlier. The fact yeah. that they were trucking out that water happened very late after they were being called out on the violations of their of their state permit. Okay. Mary Louise. Yes, really quickly. We're two decades now into the two thousands. And you have a whole west side of this community in this modern day and age that has not got access to sewer. Uh -huh. Talk about a future problem. Okay. Let's go back to our questions. Uh, Mary Louise. Yes, sir. Of the three articles on the ballot regarding amending the town's entertainment ordinance, which one do you support and why? Oh, um, let me look at the, the numbers real quick. I think it's, is it 39 and... 39 and, and, and 40. 39, 40, and 36. 36, let me look at the Selectman's Warren I believe it's 36. <laughs> that gets me excited, Selectman's Warren article. Okay. Um, I'm, I, at uh, this point in time, I'm not interested in supporting 36, but 39 and 40, I definitely will support. Did you say you would definitely support 39 and 40? Yes. Wow. I would definitely oppose 39 and 40 and reluctantly support uh, 36. All three of them call for more noise. Now, some like to call that music, but when you're trying to get to sleep, it's noise. And a lot of people are suffering. I do not. I'm located in a way where I don't have to hear it, but I have to... I can think with all, pol everyone who holds public office, I think ought to take the consideration of the entire public in mind. I think the Board of Selectmen's idea of adjusting the hours was a reasonable compromise and about as far as I would go in terms of making accommodation, uh, in terms of, you know, trying to reach a compromise. The Articles 39 and 40 were private uh, citizen warrant articles by uh, Brian Pro Prevent Sal, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, one of them actually not only calls for even more noise, uh, they both call for it, but one of them actually says, let's do away with all regulations, the entertainment license itself, throw it out the window. I mean, that's just, 
you know, beyond the pale and, and doesn't reflect any kind of sense of compromise. So 36, I can reluctantly support in the spirit of compromise. 39 and 40, absolutely not. Okay, let's turn to Brian. Brian, can your I go comments. Last, please? Yep. Can I go last on this? Uh, no, let me go right, right. with you. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I do not wish to restrict the hours of operation so I can't go along with 36. Um, I actually wrote the Warren article. I actually wrote the one before it that was pushed for by the selectmen, members of the sitting board. Some of them actually helped get it through and then it was amended um, by some people for a, a different one that a gunkwood had picked up which is 50 decibels which is unre unachievable. So they can't actually even do it. Um, the only difference here between uh, 39 and 40. 39 deletes the entertainment license and leaves it all up to the police. So when, when there's a noise complaint, the selectmen don't get called down there to see what's going on, the police do. This puts it all in their hands to let them deal with it. Article 36 reads 75 decibels from the complaint. So that's 500 feet away. So when there's a complaint, they're going to go to that house and they're going to take a reading and go, well, they're in compliance. Obviously, they're going to be because they're 500 feet away. Article 40 is the one that I wrote that leaves the entertainment li license intact to let if that makes them feel better to have the runaround that we've had going on. It's 50 feet from the property line. So if someone 500 feet away calls and says, I have a noise complaint, they're too loud over there. The police will drive down to where the place is that's making the noise, stand 50 feet in front of that property, and they have to be at 80 decibels. That's about a lawnmower. That's about what the traffic, the people, and everything down there. That's why I picked 80 decibels. 75 and 80, it doesn't make a difference. It's 5 decibels. You're not going to notice that. Now, tell me from 500 feet away on a deck or on a property, you're going to be bothered by a lawnmower. You're not. They have to be quieter with number 40 than they do with the 30, 36. 36. So it's not calling for no more noise. It's actually, I'm in the business. I've been a DJ for quite some time down there. I've worked at every single establishment on this beach. I know what I'm talking about. That's why I wrote it. It protects the, the people down the street. It protects the local business and lets them continue to do their business. With the influx of condos and people coming in down the beach, it, the businesses need to be protected. And they need, that's how we, yeah. our, beach, our town makes its money. That is our industry, the beach. Mm -hmm. It needs to be protected. We can't lose the beach. All Thank right. you. Brian, so we go from the author of 39 and 40 to a participant in number 36. Number 36. The number 36 was recommended by the Selectman 5-0. I am empathetic to the businesses at the beach. I'm empathetic to the people at the beach. I mean, it, it is a huge problem. I have to support 36. I think that's the one that we need to go with. That's the one the police chief recommended to us. That's the one we worked on. I was the one, I, th I believe, that when we changed it this year, added one day, extra day, for them to do it three days a week to go later. I, I, it, it's a big problem. It's a big problem for the business. They have to make their money in the summer. And I'm, and I'm not being wishy-washy here. I'm just stating the facts. And it's a big problem for the residents. Okay. But I go with 36. All right. Uh, in order to leave these folks enough time to do their closing statements. Why don't we jump into some of those uh, topics that you had um, placed in your speed round where we're really asking uh, for each of you to, to give the audience here and at home a quick reaction so that we can get through as many of these items as possible. Okay, uh, the first question is, uh, do you have any conflicts of interest that voters should be aware of? Right around the table. Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. Um, I have conflict of interest with entrenched powers. Okay. Brian? No, I do not. Jim? I have no conflict of interest. I think it was implied the other night that I did, and I don't. I can guarantee you that. And whoever, whomever applied, implied it, implied it absolutely wrong. And candidates have to do that, I guess. Next. Should the town continue to practice uh, the practice of picking up commercial trash? Let's start with Jim on this one. Yes. It was a Warren article. It passed. Brian? Absolutely. Yes. Jim? This is a yes or no round? No, no. Okay. The, the gentleman has chose to answer. It sound like yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> but brief, brief, <laughs> because we've got a number of these topics. There is, there is issues there relative to fairness, much like the, uh, the uh, sewer charges. Um, 
and much like the sewer charges, uh, there are opportunities to make things more fair if we were to look at the nuances of it. But I absolutely oppose just doing away with commercial trash as some would have it. I am not the kind of guy that does broad brush strokes and proclaims a problem solved. That's just a bunch of BS. You shouldn't buy it as a public. It doesn't work that way. All right? There are things that can be done to make the system more fair without disrupting uh, what is otherwise a pretty good operation, although probably more expensive than it needs to be. That's all safe for now. Thank you. Mary Louise, should the town continue the practice of picking up commercial trash? This needs to be studied in depth with a complete review of the Public Works Department so that we understand what we have to work with, if our staffing is adequate, what are the costs. I, think I consider this to be a part of an overall review of what we're doing. Okay, next. Uh, do you support Article 44, which would allow voters to weigh in on non-union wages and benefit increases? Brian, I'm going to start with you this time. Yes. Okay. Tim? I signed the petition. I remain in support of it. Uh, Mary Louise? 44. I'm trying to think. Is that Mr. Kravitz's article? Yeah, it is. Yes, I absolutely support it. Tim? No. Okay. How does this currently written? All right. Uh, back to Max. Do you support Keno in Hampton? Uh, Mary Louise? I don't support any form of gambling, so I'm not going to say one way or the, you know, I, if it's legal and the voters vote for it, fine. But personally, I, I just don't go Jim, for gambling. Jim? Yes, I support it. It, uh, it goes towards the kindergarten education, the money. Um, it's, it's a sin tax. It's a, it's a uh, um, voluntary tax. If people want to do it, they want to do it. You can go right over the border to Massachusetts and do it. I think we're taking enough time here to, to uh, put enough money aside for those that are addicted to it. But yes, I do support it. Tim, do you know in Hampton? I wonder, since you can soon go over to Massachusetts and buy marijuana, whether you would take that same position. It would be a sin tax also, I guess. I didn't ask the question. Uh, I just, I'm just wondering. I'm not asking. I'm making a statement. <laughs> I would say that uh, the keynote question is a question of, hey, where is the public harm in letting it happen? I see none. Therefore, it's a question of liberty. There's no harm in letting people decide how they want to mm -hmm. pursue their happiness. Okay. They want to pursue their happiness with Keno. It's causing no pu public harm. Let it be. I support it. Brian Keno? It's already passed in the state of New Hampshire. Other towns in the state are already doing it. I am in favor of it. Each of you individuals are either now serving on a board or have served on a board. Can you give me an example, each of you, of uh, what you've accomplished or, or give me an example of working with your fellow board members to accomplish something on the board that you are sitting on? Jim? I think, I think we worked uh, diligently on getting that wastewater treatment plant um, article together. I think, as Tim said, there was a lot of citizen input into it, too, and I think, I think the board listened to the citizens, listened to what they were saying, went back to Wright Pierce, went back to the DPW, said we'd make some modifications here. How can we change this? How can we do it? And I think that was a, a positive. Mary Louise, time on the Budget Committee, time on the Board of Selectmen, working with your fellow board members to accomplish something. What would you cite? I go back to 1978 through 81 when I was instrumental in getting the Hampton Police Department turned into a modern department. We got professionals out of Washington, D.C. to study the department. That's when they were transitioning from officers who had served in Vietnam and other officers who had never fired a weapon. I sat in the sand pits in Brentwood with the police officers of the Hampton Police Department to watch them qualify, and eventually I helped to see that they had their own shooting range in the town of Hampton. And with the late Chief Matheson and the board members, uh, we walked through the Elaine Street and the area, and we explained to all the residents why we set up that firing range. And I also worked with the department to get the old wheel guns out of the way, and we hired Vic Strawbridge out of Dover to get their new Glocks. It's been, um, it's been interesting, and, but worth the trouble of modernizing the department that you now know as your police department. Okay. Ryan, time on the zoning board. 
accomplishments I've had on the zoning board, I, I would say I, I, when I first started on the zoning board, it was back when I can remember it was Vic Lassard was on the board, and we would have <laughs> two people. There'd be someone coming from the neighbors would always fight when they'd come here, and they'd have all these differences. And I can remember two people that wouldn't even talk to each other. They're threatening to go to court and this and that. And somehow Vic would get these people to be having supper at each other's house by the end of the meeting. <laughs> um, on the board, I find that we, we try to help people. We try to help people in this town. And I'm not saying every time both sides leave happy, but we try to explain everything, go out of our way to explain it to the other people so they understand all the issues so that they can work together because that's what we're there. We're there to help. And that's why I'm on the board, to help people. And that's my biggest accomplishment. I've been on there for about 11 years is to help people in Hampton. That's what I'm doing. Tim, many years on the budget committee. Well, I'm glad to hear about Vic's accomplishments. I, I really <laughs> enjoyed Vic uh, when he was around. We had some very lively conversations. As far as the budget committee is concerned, I've been on it for five years. And I think that anyone who's paid attention to the budget committee over the last five years, if you compare now to five years ago, you're talking about a radical improvement on many fronts. And I believe I contributed to those improvements, mostly behind the scenes, sometimes on camera, uh, relative to a variety of topics. Uh, the absurdity of what was taking place in the Budget Committee prior to my arrival, such as the Budget Committee is not allowed to inquire on policy. We're only supposed to throw holy water on the amount of money people are asking for. It's absurd. The whole purpose you're asking money for is the policy behind it. So not be able to ask questions about public policy is absurd. The recognition of in terms of exactly what the Budget Committee is supposed to do, which is to advise voters, to get into the depth uh, because the general voter doesn't have the time to get into the depth. We get into the depth of things and we advise the voter. To say that the Budget Committee shouldn't, shouldn't look into policy is the, the same as saying the voter shouldn't look at policy. It's just absurd. So all that has not been heard of for years now. There are a variety of changes that are just too much to enumerate. Okay, thank you. So in order to um, respect our time limits, uh, I'm going to now move into uh, that part of our program where we allow each candidate two minutes, um, up to two minutes, to, um, to discuss anything that they, um, they haven't been able to or got cut off on, um, <coughs> and, um, and otherwise summarize why they are, are running uh, to be one of the two uh, new selectmen positions um, or two selectmen positions um, this year. So we're going to go as they are listed in the uh, ballot that you will receive on March 13th, and that means that Brian goes first and followed by Jim and then Mary Louise, and our final uh, two minutes will come from um, Tim. So Brian. Okay. Um, I grew up in Hampton. I've lived here my entire life. I've been here 40 years. My family has been here for close to 90 years, both sides of my family. My mom and dad went to school here. I went to every aspect of school here. My daughter's seven years old. She goes to school here. I believe in Hampton. I don't have any personal agenda running other than I love this town, and I believe in this town, and I know I can bring something to the table. I understand zoning a lot. I've been on that board for quite some time. I don't plan on leaving the zoning board. I plan on doing both. Um, I'm a glutton for punishment. Um, <laughs> I'm for the basic infrastructure of this town. I think some politics have kind of got out of play. I think that we should be taking care of the town. We should just be sticking to the basic infrastructure, water, sewer, the people that work for us, our town infrastructure, roads and sewers and whatnot. I think that, that, that the, the waters have been muddied a little bit. That's what needs to be taken care of, and that's my only agenda. Thank you. Jim? Yeah, I'd like to thank all the candidates. I think it's a, it's a great... Uh, election this time because we have five candidates running for two spots. It's terrible when you have people running unopposed. So people can make a decision. They can look at the candidates and they can make a decision. Every single solitary one of us has a history in town. People can go to Channel 22, look at the streaming videos. You can watch the meetings. You can watch how each individual candidate interacts with the other candidates or the other members of their boards. And you can make a decision from that. I agree with Brian that uh, 
that things have gotten out of hand a little bit. We've, we've gotten into some name calling. We've gotten into some labeling people. We've, we've gotten into issues that we shouldn't be in. I think we need cooperation. I think we need to think things through. I think we need to work together. I think members of a board need to work together. I think members, each board needs to work with other boards to be cooperative, to get things done. I don't think we always have to agree. I think you can look back at my record, and there's been many times that it's been a 4-1 vote. I'm not afraid to take a vote that doesn't go along with everybody. I will stand up. I will take a position. I will let people know what my position is. I will not be afraid to do that. But again, I'd like to thank everybody who's running. I think we have a great election coming up, and good luck to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Louise Wolsey. Patrick and Max, thank you and the Hampton Union for, for your devotion over the years. Patrick goes way back. Um, I raised my four children here. I buried my husband here. I have worked first when the children were in school. I've worked with the uh, local school district. And then in 78, I started a career representing you on the Board of Selectmen and the Budget Committee and Charter Commissions, et cetera. Um, I believe that when you transition from a candidate to an actual elected official, you should become a, a um, let's see, you, you should become a public servant. You should try to avoid all the conflicts and there are, there are personality clashes that come in, but your job is to work for the public. I have never turned anyone down who sought help. I have never blocked anyone's email. I take phone calls, whatever your difficulty is. If I can't help you, I'll find a way to help you. And I firmly believe that we can get together work together and review our town in depth so that we're getting the best value for the taxpayer that we possibly can. Make sure all the departments are running efficiently. Make sure that we're taking care of the wonderful men and women who work for us and taking care of you, the voters. I've very much appreciated the opportunity to serve you and I'll be happy to do it again. Thank you. Timothy Citizen Jones. Thank you. I don't recall, I've been in public now five years, I don't recall ever calling anyone a name, ever. I've never criticized one person in or outside this community. I have criticized many people's ideas. I am an ideas guy. <laughs> I deal with ideas. I don't deal with personalities. So that's why there's no reason for me to call names. I've called ideas all kinds of names. Because we've had all kinds of, you know, names worthy of being, uh, ideas worthy of being called names. And while I didn't come in with the first tide, uh, as Vic Lasalle used to say, uh, I have been here 22 years, and uh, this here is my prepared closing statement. Wow. Which I am not going to read. Because I have been rather disturbed tonight by uh, this issue on the lawsuit. So I'm going to speak on that, which I wrote down here. You know, we have a four to one vote, as Jim rightfully pointed out, in terms of taking the lawsuit. Now we're in this course of action. And uh, what remains on the Board of Selectmen now are uh, basically three votes in favor. Uh, two of those, or one of those, is certainly strong. And the other one is fairly strong. And the third one is, you know, and I'm concerned that, you know, this old thing when I learned when I was a kid, you know, the old saying my brothers, my older brothers taught me is that you don't swim halfway across the lake and decide that you're too tired and swim back. You keep going. It's the same distance if you're halfway between. You might as well just keep on going. And that's where we are with this lawsuit. We're in it. We have to maintain a united resolve through this process now, we're in it. We have to be united in being resolved to get a fair deal for the taxpayers. We mustn't let anything prevent that from happening. So I wanted to emphasize that very much. And I suppose I should point out the last portion of this prepared one, which was, <laughs> uh, I ask for your vote, and in return I will work tirelessly for the best interests of all the citizens 
and I will not care whether it gives me votes or not, I am not going to serve any special interest. All the citizens will be into my consideration on every decision I make. My name on the ballot is Timothy Citizen Jones. You will find my name on the bottom of the list with the powers that be, too often, try to keep all ordinary citizens at the very bottom. If you vote for me, the citizens will find themselves no longer at the bottom. More often, you will be at the top where you belong. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary Louise Woolsey, Timothy Citizen Jones, Brian Provencal, James Waddell, and uh, Brian McNamara are your candidates for uh, Brendan, 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 excuse me. Um, I just go with me twice. Uh, <laughs> Brendan McNamara are your candidates um, for selectmen. You are uh, uh, urged to select two or you're entitled to select two. Um, we thank all of you for joining us. Thank uh, Max Sullivan, Patrick Cronin for um, hosting tonight. Uh, and with that, we're going to yield the room uh, to another candidate's night, uh, which I understand is being held by the Hampton PTA. If I could thank you, Bob. No, thank you. <laughs> All right. I think we're, we're finished March 13th, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Winnicott High School. <laughs>